Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Historical Society of the New York Courts program from Stonewall to Windsor, New York's March to LGBTQ Rights. I'm Steve Younger. I'm the chair of the Historical Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight. I just want to share with you the mission of our society. We're about preserving, protecting, and promoting our rich legal history in New York. We do that through educational outreach. We do it through our publications, and I encourage you to, to get our publications. Um, we do it through exhibits. We have oral histories of famous uh, New Yorkers, whether on the bench or the bar. And we do it through public programs like this. Now, unfortunately, we haven't had many programs like this in the last three years. In fact, this is our first program that's been live since the pandemic. Actually, our biggest program ever was right after the pandemic struck, but it was virtual. And it's so nice to see people, isn't it? Um, it is our 20th anniversary year. So tonight's program is part of our anniversary programming. Um, this special event features firsthand accounts from lawyers and judges who lived the dramatic history, which is so much focused on New York, as you'll see tonight, of the protection of rights for LGBTQ people in our state. I just want to share one memory, and Hank, I know you'll appreciate this. I was in Cooperstown, New York, a little over 10 years ago, the night that Governor Cuomo signed the marriage equality bill. It was the summer meeting of the New York State Bar, and I had happened to be the president at the time. And we had spent much of the year fighting for marriage equality. And it was a celebration. And I know it was a celebration all through New York. So um, I encourage you to participate tonight. I also encourage you to sign up. We have a program in June, on June 9th, on John Jay's legacy, which is completely free, by the way. And I encourage you to go to our website, which has more history about the Historical Society as we enter our 20th year. So now we're going to have a very special welcome uh, by video from our president, Chief Judge Jonathan Levin. Welcome to the New York Historical Society of the Courts presentation from Stonewall to Windsor, New York's march to LGBTQ rights. This is part of the Judith S.K. program. It's a series sponsored by Skadden Arps in honor of my predecessor as Chief Judge, Judith S. K. I can't think of a more topical program given the pendency of Roe versus Wade before the United States Supreme Court and the resulting focus on the protection of our constitutional rights, rights going forward. The program includes some great panelists uh, Christopher Riano talking about the march towards LGBTQ rights. The Honorable Roz Richter uh, talking about recounting a time as Executive Director of Lambda. The Honorable Matthew Detone talking about the 80s and 90s and his father's work and time spent on the Staten Island's AIDS Task Force. Our own Robbie Kaplan, a member of our board, talking about a time as law clerk for Judith Kay and the Hernandez decision during that time, and of course, her own phenomenal work in the Windsor case before the Supreme Court. And all of this moderated by our board member, uh, Hank Greenberg, who will do it all with his usual style and focus and energizing presence. The Historical Society couldn't be happier than to sponsor this kind of a program that really focuses on the history, the glorious history of our courts in New York. And really it's jurisprudence, the jurisprudence of the courts which are renowned throughout the United States. You are in for a real treat tonight. This is a fabulous panel, a, a really just uh, couldn't be more interesting subject matter. And the only thing I can say to you is enjoy. Welcome and enjoy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Lippman. Um, I just want to emphasize our thanks to the Skadden Arps firm. Many of us knew Judge Kay, 
you know, she was in dissent in Robles, but she ended up being on the right side when the legislature got there. And our trustee, Alex Drelewski, is here representing the firm. Thank you very much. So at this point, I want to turn it over to my friend Hank Greenberg, who is a partner with Greenberg Traurig. I think his, his grandmother still thinks that the Greenberg and Greenberg Traurig is him, um, <laughs> and is a former president of our New York State Bar. Hank. You have to admit it's a great name for a law firm. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, this is tonight a great, great night in the life of our profession. With so much in the world as we look around it that might cause us despair, so much polarization and all of that, tonight we gather to talk about a subject to come together and celebrate our nation's extraordinary march to LGBTQ rights from Stonewall to Windsor and the singular role New York lawyers and New York courts played in the battle for equality. Indeed, all of us here, every single one of us, I think everyone that's watching online, if they're old enough to understand the words coming out of our mouths, they have been part, they have been living through one of the most extraordinary and wonderful chapters in American legal history. When I graduated law school in the Stone Age, the 1980s, 1986 to be exact, more than 30 years ago, my senior year in law school, my third year in 1986, the United States Supreme Court handed down Bowers versus Hardwick. That's right, Bowers versus Hardwick in my lifetime was handed down five to four decision which upheld the ban on sodomy in Georgia. Back then, when I was a third year law student, it required prophetic powers and a faith I confess I did not then have to believe that in my lifetime, the world would view sexual orientation, or at least New York State would view sexual orientation as a legal irrelevancy and same-sex marriage as a constitutional right. But here we are today, more than 30 years later, and Bowers thankfully has been relegated to the dustbin of history, and marriage equality is the law of the land, not just in New York, but across the nation. And in large measure, that extraordinary transformation in American jurisprudence was due to the trailblazers to my left, history makers, and it is our privilege and pleasure tonight to hear from them all. The way we're going to set the table, and I'll tell you a little bit about our program tonight, we are really blessed because the person who is going to set the table for us is one of the nation's preeminent historians on the march to progress for the LGBTQ community. And of course, I'm talking about Christopher Riano. He is a rock star as a legal historian, as a lawyer, as a civics leader, as a leader of the bar. He is currently president of the Center for Civic Education the nation's largest constitutional law and civic education nonprofit. He is a lecturer at constitutional law and government at Columbia, where he teaches multiple courses. He has already, young as he looks, a distinguished career in public service, which includes a tenure as an assistant counsel to a governor, general counsel for a state agency, and an administrative law judge. Most notably, I suppose, for today's program, he is the co-author of the award-winning book, Marriage Equality, From Outlaws to In-Laws, published by Yale University Press in 2020. It tells the definitive story of marriage equality from 1967 to 2015, has an extraordinary chapter about New York itself. I commend it to all of you. Uh, after Chris gives us this overview, about the extraordinary progress that has been made and some of the history that was made in New York, which led to history across the nation. We will hear from our extraordinary panelists. Like I said, history makers, trailblazers, each and every one of them. Judge Rosalind Richter is a senior counsel at Arnold and Palmer Porter, but I think for many of us, we revered her long before her return to the practice of law owing to her nearly 30 years as one of our state and nation's preeminent judges. 
She was an associate justice of the appellate division for 10 years on the first department. Before that, she was a trial judge for 19 years. She's an adjunct professor at Columbia, before that taught at Brooklyn and New York Law School. And today, for our purposes, what we're most eager to hear about is her tenure, her extraordinarily storied tenure as the executive director and special project attorney of the Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund, and in fact, its first paid staff attorney. Small wonder, owing to that work and her extraordinary career, that in 2018, the National LGBT Bar Association bestowed on her their highest honor and recognition of her path-breaking legacy of service. After uh, Judge Richter tells us, focusing on the most challenging days, the 70s and the 80s, long before the dream of Windsor and Oberfell were realized, we're going to also next hear from Matthew Titone, the surrogate of Richmond County. He himself has had an extraordinary career in public service as well. Before he was a surrogate of Richmond County, he began his legal career as an attorney for the Staten Island AIDS Task Force and Project Humanity in 1992. In addition, he served with great distinction in the New York State Assembly, and we're going to be fortunate to hear a little bit about some of what uh, Steve Younger alluded to with the famous New York's um, uh, legislature enacting marriage equality in 2011. He is the first openly gay elected official in Richmond County, the first openly gay surrogate in New York, the first openly gay surrogate in the United States of America. Think about that. That's a position where family law issues and the like are so important, the first in the nation. And he is also the vice chair of the Surrogates Association of New York State. Uh, and while we're going to hear about his extraordinary leadership with respect to LGBTQ rights, we're also going to hear a little bit about his blessed father, um, Vito Titone, beloved by so many of us, and the story of Brashy and that decision, which uh, we're going to be able to hear a little bit about from his son, uh, who follows very proudly in that extraordinary man's tradition and history. Next, our cleanup hitter. <laughs> A legend, Roberta Kaplan, one of our nation's preeminent commercial litigators and public interest lawyers. She is the founding partner. She created it, Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink. It is unique because it is a firm that combines cutting edge civil and criminal litigation practice with an extraordinary commitment to public interest and serving the public. Before that, she spent a quarter of a century making a mark as I said, one of the nation's preeminent commercial litigators at Paul Weiss, where she was for 25 years. And as breathtakingly great a litigator as she is, perhaps she is best known to this audience, and I should say the country and the world, for her winning oral argument and brief in United States versus Windsor, the landmark case that compelled the federal government to recognize same-sex marriage, that laid the foundation two years later for Oberfell, where the Supreme Court ruled at long last that same-sex couples had a constitutional right to marry, legalizing it for the entire country. Tonight she will talk about her work in Windsor, her service for Judge Kay when she was a law clerk for Judge Kay, uh, and all in all, one of the great battlers of social justice. So after we hear these presentations, we'll have a, a panel discussion that I will have the privilege of moderating, and hopefully I will make sure, not just hopefully, that we have enough time to take questions from all of you. So without further ado, it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Christopher Riano. I want to thank uh, you, Hank, for that really lovely introduction. I want to thank the Chief Judge for that wonderful introduction. And I, of course, want to thank everybody who's here with us this evening, both in person and virtually, as we celebrate an incredible history of the LGBTQ community in New York specifically, but even, lar uh, even more at large. I've been asked to give a history of a movement that stretches back many, many decades in about 20 minutes. So I'm going to be both brief and bold in what we open and discuss this evening with. So many people who call New York home do so because of the promise or maybe the heartfelt belief 
that we instill and distill within our state motto, Excelsior. Maybe even more so now, in such uncertain times than ever before. People like Marsha P. Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, Keith Haring, James Baldwin, Willie Ninja, who was my runway instructor, and I miss him dearly every day. Paul Feynman, who I know we all miss as a bench and a bar. Adapted by the New York State Senate in 1778, the motto is taken from the Latin word excelsius, high. Hence, excelsior written onto the state flag to accompany a sun rising above the mountains can be translated as even higher or even better ever upward. I myself moved to New York City homeless at 19 years old with $400 in my pocket to live in a storage unit on 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street. It is still there, which is amazing to me. And I bribed the front desk clerk with sandwiches so I could stay there because I believe so deeply in that call of Excelsior that these sidewalks in this great state were truly made of the boldest of dreams and opportunities that one could ever imagine. In a famous 19th century poem by the same name, Henry Longfellow dramatizes the siren call of the New York State motto for those aspiring to the great heights and elusive achievements. A voice replied far up the height, Excelsior. The poem reveals an uneasy tension within Excelsior between valiant warriors and the often exclusive, far receding goals that they strive to meet. Like the Excelsior in the poem, the clarion call of high achievement attracts many people to New York, and I'm sure many in this room and with us today. And it also ensures a vast population of high achieving people fiercely competing to be the best. And that, my friends, is the amazing paradox of the history of not only the LGBTQ rights movement in New York State, but the paradox of all social justice and equality movements that have long considered New York to be a better place for all. Our history as a state has never really lived up to that lofty ideal. And like a swinging pendulum, I was just having this conversation with folks earlier, the true story of the LGBTQ rights movement has been one of both incredible achievement and heartbreaking setbacks. I know we're amongst lawyers this evening, so let me give you a pointed example of what I mean. Since its promulgation in 1934, the New York State Alcoholic Beverage Control Law, something that probably only I have ever thought about, has included a crucial provision that historically has given wide latitude to law enforcement to regulate establishments and regulate them in a way to quell any so-called disorderly conduct. According to uh, New York State Alcohol Beverage Control Law Section 1066, for close to 100 years now, no person shall license to, to sell alcoholic beverages, shall suffer or permit such premises to become disorderly. This was the law in 1934 and remains the law this very day, May 25th, 2022. I was the first LGBTQ general counsel of the State Liquor Authority. I checked this afternoon. I promise you, it's still there. Now, while in the city of New York, there has often been a strong collective identity among LGBTQ people and our allies, that identity was most often found and forged through underground subcultures. For example, Harlem's nightclubs in the 20s and 30s provided a refuge for thousands of famous drag balls where people could dance freely and without fear of recrimination. Participants competed for trophies, often imitating and sometimes perfecting many of the traits of the dominant heterosexual culture. In other words, and I think this is important, these balls reflected how pervasive the Excelsior ethos is in New York, permeating barriers of race, of class, of gender, sexuality. But while underground balls were occurring in secret in the 1950s and 60s, law enforcement officials around the state, including those at the State Liquor Authority itself, continually defined the word disorderly to include the mere presence 
of LGBTQ individuals within a licensed premise. As early as the 1940s, the New York State courts ruled that the State Liquor Authority and by extension law enforcement could legally close down bars and arrest patrons that served sexual variants, making it permissible for the SLA and law enforcement to target the LGBTQ community. It's this interpretation preceding the events at Stonewall that sparked early LGBTQ activism in the Mattachine Society and in the infamous April 21st, 1966 SIP-IN. Showing a similar dedication and purpose as many of the incredible civil rights activists of the 1950s who participated in sit-ins, young men went from bar to bar that day with a note in direct reference to the alcohol laws saying, we are homosexuals. We believe that a place of public accommodation has an obligation to serve an orderly person and that we are entitled to service as long as we are orderly. After receiving frictionless service at many establishments, the group made their way to Julius, where they anticipated resistance because of in an incident earlier that day. They sidled up to the bar, passed the bartender their note, and were immediately refused service. As the New York Times said in an article that they ran, the headline read, three deviants invite exclusion by bars. They visit four before being refused service in a test of the State Liquor Authority rules. This period of social uprising and legal uncertainty lit a fuse that resulted in the explosive events of June 28, 1969, where the New York City Police Department, including members of the Public Morals Squad, raided the Stonewall Inn, shouting, police, we are taking the place. The Stonewall Inn was famously host to many members of the local community, particularly as a safe haven to LGBTQ youth and many, many others who could not find another place to spend the evening. In many instances, these individuals were not welcome and could not afford to go to other meeting places and throwing bottles and anything else they had at hand. The patrons fought back against the New York City Police Department to preserve their ground. And like so many other social justice movements, this courageous act of civil disobedience at the Stonewall Inn became the battle cry that announced a new wave for, of the movement for LGBTQ rights. This is New York. We are famous for activism. We are famous for going into the streets and pleading our cause. And on June 28th in 1970, one year after Stonewall, the now annual New York City Pride March was conceived as Christopher Street Liberation Day, an homage to the Stonewall Inn's address on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village. A founder of the Gay Liberation Front, Michael Brown, aptly noted that we will never have the freedom and civil rights we deserve as human beings unless we stop hiding in closets and in the shelter of being anonymous. We have to come out into the open. We have to stop being ashamed or else people will go on treating us as freaks. This march is an affirmation and a declaration of our new pride. Now, Lest us think that that's where this story ends in New York, it is merely where we can imagine it begins. Two years after Stonewall, the often torturous organs of New York state government began their dance towards what we might be able to call, call a more equal New York. In February 1971, an assemblyman and a senator introduced the first Sexual, discrimination non -discri sexual Orientation Non-Discrimination Act, known as SONDA, which was resoundingly defeated. It would be almost 20 years later, in 1990, that Assemblywoman Deborah Glick would be the first openly gay member of the State Assembly, and her election platform was predicated on making the passage of Sonda a top priority. With her election and the wind at her back, Sonda would pass the Assembly three years later by a vote of 90 to 50, foreshadowing an often familiar issue when it came to the showdown in the New York State Legislature. The Senate would not even take up the legislation, even after the Assembly had passed not just this, but other types of legis legislation time and time again. It would be almost 10 years and until about late 2002, and only in the wake of the tragedy of September 11, that Sonda would pass both houses of the legislature and be signed into law. And as the legislative chambers frequently went back and forth to make some progress on LGBTQ rights, it was the New York Court of Appeals that was the primary government body that was taking proactive steps in protecting LGBTQ persons. 
1980, many, many, many decades before 2003 in the United States Supreme Court decision in Lawrence v. Texas, it was the New York Court of Appeals that struck down the 1965 uh, law that made consensual sodomy a misdemeanor crime. They voted five to two that it was not a function of the state's criminal penal laws to prescribe or to dictate moral or religious values unto, other, unto others. In 1989, in a case we're going to hear about soon, the Court of Appeals waded into the waters of legally defining the concept of family as defined under the law in a case brought by Lambda Legal, an organization, as we know, that was spearheaded and, uh, by Justice Richter, which I'm sure she'll say much more about very shortly. And in deciding Brashi versus Stahl Associates, and in the middle of the incredible change that was happening during the AIDS crisis, the New York Court of Appeals ruled that the rent control laws of New York apply to LGBTQ couples living together in long-term relationships because, as Chief Judge Kay said, when she was asked about the case, that was their home, that was their family. I'm sure Judge Detone, whose father was instrumental in deciding that case, will have much more to say about that as well later. And during the 1900, excuse me, the 1990s and early 2000s, much of the work of the LGBTQ rights uh, movement and legal community was often divided. What were we supposed to fight for? Domestic partnerships? Marriage? Seemed a little far off, especially back then. Were we fighting just to make sure that we could adopt? We're, there's so many different questions that were coming up within the various different groups in the LGBTQ rights space. And while there were critical rights secured, domestic partnership laws started popping up, especially spearheaded by certain executives in certain cities. Eventually, as the 2000s went on, more and more of the community came to understand how important marriage equality was going to be to securing truly equal families, particularly following the victory in Massachusetts in 2003. And as often the case in New York, our incredible intersectionality as a city and state would prove to be at the heart of why equal marriage would come to pass. I'm gonna tell a very quick little story that I don't think most people know. People probably up here might know, but I don't know how many too many other people know this. Most people here know New York's Supreme Court Justice Doris Ling Cohen. What most people here probably do not know is that her life is the textbook example of a tenacious bootstrapping, ever upward, excelsior individual. And as the first woman of Asian descent to be appointed to an appellate panel in New York State, it is not surprising that she played an outsized role in New York's marriage equality story. She was born in Chinatown, the daughter of a seamstress and laundry worker, and enjoyed one of those only in New York lives and careers. By 12, she was navigating the courthouse while accompanying her mother, who was set to attend a criminal hearing. Doris learned how important law is to family and to one's family's life. A 76 graduate of Brooklyn College, a 79 graduate of New York University School of Law, she worked part-time as a seamstress in the factories in Chinatown in order to support herself and pay for school. She served in a number of different roles, including in the AG's office, and was eventually elected to the civil court, and then was able to garner a ton of support for her state Supreme Court seat that she received in 2002. As storied as the rest of her career has been, her career on the bench will most likely best be remembered for her part in the New York State story on marriage equality as a staunch and unprecedented straight ally. And I think this is important to recognize when it comes to realizing the importance of allyship for social justice, an important straight ally of the community. Because it was her second year on the bench as an elected state Supreme Court justice that she ruled in Hernandez, and we'll hear more about Hernandez later, that the New York State Constitution's Due Process and Equal Protection Clause prohibited the state from discriminating against same-sex couples who wished to enter into marriage. It was her second year on the bench. I want to emphasize that again. It's incredible when you think about that. She brought the entire controversy surrounding that under New York State law up to date with New York City's domestic partnership ordinances and questions about the rights to marriage. And as a sitting justice, she agreed with the plaintiffs that their exclusion from the inclusion of marriage was a constitutional, state constitutional violation. She stayed the appeal. The first department, of course, said, you cannot do that. You've got to be out of your mind, right? This is unprecedented. And this eventually went up to the Court of Appeals, and briefs and oral arguments were scheduled for the end of May 2006. 
The May 31st oral arguments were quite a spectacle. I'm not going to say much because Roberta Kaplan was there and she argued. <laughs> so she can say that and speak to it for herself. But in dominating oral argument with an adversarial style, Judge Robert Smith was laser focused on the question of New York State having a rational basis to treat same sex and opposite sex couples differently by law. The Court of Appeals issued its decision on July 6, 2006, as expected based on his overall, I believe, 150 questions. He wrote the plurality opinion and delivered the judgment of the court. <clears throat> Judge Smith put into writing what he alluded to during oral argument, leaving no doubt how he felt about judicial involvement in the case. We hold that the New York State Constitution does not compel recognition of marriages between members of the same sex. Whether such marriages should be recognized is a question to be addressed by the legislature. Many of those in here who practice and have practiced law for many, many years know that one of the last things you want to hear from a court where you're hoping to gain relief is that you have to go to Albany. But that's essentially what folks were told. In a heartfelt dissent, New York's mother of justice, Chief Judge Judith Kay, lamented, the state has a proud tradition of affording equal rights to all New Yorkers. Sadly, the court today retreats from that proud tradition. I am confident that future generations will look back on today's decision as an unfortunate misstep. And that was the end of state judicial review, at least when it came to marriage, and that incredibly important concept and this shifted everything to the infamously gridlocked state legislature. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the legislative process because we could be here forever, but I do think it's important to note a few things. One, if everybody remembers in late 2006, something was going on at the governor's office here in New York, because that happens all the time. We had a governor, Governor Spitzer, who was a pro-marriage equality governor, supposedly, who maybe, let's just say, flew a little too close to the sun. And like, as an Excelsior governor, was, fell just as swiftly as he ascended. And with certain threats of impeachment looming, he announced he was resigning on March 17th of that year. And Lieutenant Governor Patterson was sworn in by Chief Judge Kay, and Immediately, within actually just, I believe, not immediately, but within about two months, Judge, uh, excuse me, Governor Pattison began to use the executive to pass executive orders to say that this state had to recognize marriages that were valid in other states. You see something similar happening at the Comptroller's office because we like to keep things complicated in New York. And while there are other really important things happening in the LGBTQ rights space, I'd be remiss not to note that while this is uh, pending, there are other bills critical to the community. There's a crucial change that happens to same-sex domestic partnerships passed that allows access to family court. Those of us who practice in family court, I do not, but those of us that do know how important it is for domestic violence cases. Those cases were opened up in many ways while marriage equality was continuing to percolate. And as this constant back and forth had gone on, Governor Patterson, again, pro, he was a pro-marriage equality governor, and in the assembly, there was a constant and consistent ability to get bills passed, even if in the Senate, they would never make it to the floor. Essentially, in late 2009, Governor Patterson and the assembly pushed bills to the floor. They got bills through the Senate because of some changes in Senate leadership. However, as, need, as always needed in politics, proper hands had not been shook and proper babies had not been kissed. And the ultimate Senate vote was 24 to 38, a crushing defeat. That by political standards is quite shocking because if you don't have the votes, you usually don't bring up the bill. The story of the defeat in 2009 is the story of a lack in many ways of the politics that happened in Albany. Excelsior Ever Upward requires constant hard work and grit. Now, at this time, in many ways, this was seen as a, a real low point when it came to looking at LGBTQ rights and especially marriage equality in New York State. But I want to be very clear that there were some very talented lawyers, one who's up here with us today, that recognized that even while that may have been happening at the state level, there were always opportunities at the federal level. And in 2010, Roberta Kaplan filed Windsor versus United States a critical case that would eventually lead to the end 
of the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, based in many pieces and in large part because various pieces of New York were recognizing marriages from other states. And there were lots of questions that were coming up around that. But I know Robbie's going to want to speak about that, and I want to give her that grace and space to do so. In 2009, the Senate vote goes against the marriage equality bill. No Demo you get eight Democrats voted no, zero Republicans who vote yes. Windsor was winning in the federal courts due to some incredible litigating. And in 2011, as all of us know, there was a new governor. And he made it his mission in many ways to make this one of his signature achievements. He looked for weak spots in the state Senate. He wanted to get every Democrat on the bill. Between Wednesday, June 1st of 2011 and Thursday, June 7th of 2011, he dedicated himself to doing the work of shaking hands and kissing babies with the key senators he wanted to flip. He promised them political support in exchange for the backing of the soon to be finalized bill. And while a vote was not immediately calendared in the Senate, protests began to engulf the New York State Capitol building with people and organizations on all sides of the marriage equality debate lobbying incessantly. But the bill was going to the floor. And as was said earlier today, those who were there remember this day very, very well. After the bill was called for a vote, a, the roll call pierced what had become a deafening silence. The first to vote was Senator, now mayor, because nobody changes in New York, Eric Adams, who did the same as he did in 2009 and voted yes on the bill. No surprise. The second to vote was Senator Joseph, Joseph Adabo, who now voted yes on the bill. That was a change, and everybody was pretty impressed. But it was Republican Senator Jim Alisi who went from no to yes the second time. Everybody knew that the die was cast. The final vote was 32 to 28. The Marriage Equality Act had passed with votes to spare. New York was the first state in the nation for legislative marriage equality, and most certainly the first of our size. In 2013, Edie Windsor and Robbie Kaplan would take Windsor to the US Supreme Court, setting up a New York case as a major test of the durability of the Substantive Due Process Clause and Equal Protection Clause at the federal level. This was, of course, set into place the domino effect of Obergefell and the eventual federalization of marriage equality for all Americans. In 2016, interestingly enough, our straight ally, Justice Lynn Cohen, would go on to lose the usually perfunctory renomination recommendation to the bench by a narrow 10 to 12 recommendation rejection by the independent screening panel. And that recommendation rarely ever happens, was actually ignored for one of the first times in recent history when the delegates to the county judicial convention instead still picked her because in large part, the New York City LGBTQ community came out and pushed incredibly hard for her to remain on the bench. For a state whose motto is ever upward, I want to close right where we began. Since marriage equality, countless pieces of legislation, executive action, and judicial decision making have made a massive difference in the rights, liberties, and responsibilities of the LGBTQ community in the state of New York. The work of ensuring equality for all and social justice for all communities is never a static act but one of a consistent need to strive ever upward to reach our state's promise. This work is never done. Right now, both in New York and in states across the nation, lawyers like Robbie Kaplan are at the forefront of protecting LGBTQ rights in a number of contemporary issues. And just as we began discussing how the alcohol beverage control statute, still on the books today, was one of the primary tools used to criminalize LGBTQ public gatherings and accommodations in New York. There's a case at the United States Supreme Court next term that could supplant public accommodation protections across the country and allow for discrimination against the LGBTQ community in places of public accommodation once again. I ask that everybody here tonight in squeezing this history together really, really fast note a few things, both here in person and virtually. First, recognize that the story of justice, doesn't matter if it's social justice, racial justice, LGBTQ justice, is the story of the rule of law. It's the story of allyship. It is the story of Excelsior. While New York State has at times been at the forefront of that story, let's remember that it is up to each of us to ensure that the next 19-year-old who comes here to make their dreams come true 
does so in a state that celebrates what they have to contribute to our collective well-being, striving together to live up to our state motto. Now, much more importantly, let's turn to our discussion this evening, and I want to thank everybody for allowing me to give that very brief overview of the last 50 years. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me, and greetings to those on the video. Well, if Hank Greenberg went to law school in the Stone Age, I, I don't know, that makes me pre-Stone Age. Um, or maybe I was just a mere child when I went to school. So I, I'm going to take you back um, to a time when there were no rights. Um, so I came out in college in 1974-75, a little bit sort of on the cups. Uh, there were no openly gay lawyers that I knew of. Uh, there were no openly gay or lesbian judges anywhere in the United States. Uh, there were no civil rights that I or anyone knew about. Um, and gay men and lesbians didn't talk to each other for the most part, um, except when everybody got arrested at a demonstration. So I, I think, um, and I never would have expected to be standing here as a former appellate judge. So people have asked me over the decades whether I've always wanted to be a judge. And after I sort of stopped laughing, and I say, well, if you've been out since college and you're as old as I am, you never thought about always wanting to be a judge because pretty much everybody told me that it would kill my career for me to be out in law school, including my parents, um, a blessed memory. Um, they admitted they were wrong and so was everybody else um, because obviously I had a great career and this room I look around is filled with other openly gay LGBT judges, law clerks, lawyers, partners at law firms. Um, but in the mid sort of, so I cannot take you back to the formation of Lambda whose 50th anniversary is next year, which is really a remarkable thing. Um, and I feel like we should acknowledge that this organization would not have existed but for Bill Tom and a very courageous group of two or three gay men, um, all of whom now have gone from AIDS, except for Bill, to my knowledge, um, who formed the organization um, and who put their careers on the line because pretty much everybody thought you could not be admitted to the bar, you could not get through the character committee. Um, and to be honest, I was, in 1979, when I graduated law school, I was sort of worried about it, but I was young and sort of said, well, why wouldn't they take me? Um, they did, obviously. Uh, but I think it's really important before I talk about cases to talk about, uh, because I was asked for tonight, what were the leading cases? And there weren't very many because no one really in their right mind at that point, or at least that's what most people thought, would have been a named plaintiff in an LG, there was no B and T, it was homosexual rights case back then, if you didn't have to be, because there was no housing protection, your landlord could kick you out. There was no protection in family law, you could lose your children. There was, it was a crime um, and you were perceived to be a criminal so you could lose your job. You could not get a security clearance. Um, and, and people were just literally trying to survive. Um, and, and that doesn't mean that there weren't people who were known to each other. Um, but this whole sort of, I guess, movement that arose with AIDS and going forward um, just did not exist back then. Um, and I just, before I talk about Anofri, which was really the first large case I worked on, um, I guess a former judge, you do your research, so I did for today. And I found a case that brought me back in time to 1978 called DiStefano 
B. DiStefano from the Appellate Division, Fourth Department. So 1978, my legal lifetime. And in the DiStefano case, pretty uninteresting now, um, divorce case, custody case. And the Fourth Department in 1978 ruled that the fact that the mother was a lesbian and had acknowledged her lesbian relationship and had quote unquote failed to keep her relationship separate from her role as a mother meant she could not get custody. Um, because knowing that your mother was a lesbian would have a detrimental impact on a child. Um, and that was the law when I was in law school. That's the family law I studied. That's the law that people of my generation who had been in heterosexual marriages um, and were splitting up were dealing with. Um, so people lied, obviously, didn't tell your client to lie. Um, but pretty much everybody knew that you settle your divorce case. You don't ask for child support. Um, you don't ask for whatever it is you want in the hope that that person will not find out that you're a lesbian. Gay men, uh, no, but no one was given custody. To, to gay men at the time. I don't know any case anywhere in the country in the 70s where that happened. Um, and if you got custody, the condition was that you not have your partner overnight when the children were there. So we've come obviously a huge way in New York now over the decades. We have surrogacy, we have second parent adoption. Um, it's really quite, remarkable to me. We even have three parents in some cases. Um, but that's what it was like then. And then um, People versus Anafri was filed. Um, unlike the cases you're going to hear about, Anafri was not a case that was generated by a public interest organization. Again, just to take you back historically, it wasn't First of all, there weren't a group of well-funded lawyers sitting in a conference room supported by big law firms like the one I, got, I now am at, who said, let's work with a nonprofit and try to come up with the ideal plaintiff and who would, that just didn't exist. Um, the cases came because some hysterical person was on the phone calling saying, I just got arrested, I just got evicted, I just lost my children, and I don't want to tell anyone that I'm gay, what can you do for me? Um, that was sort of what I did my first year at Lambda. Not much you can do for somebody. Um, so Anafri came about because a gay man was arrested for having sex consensually with another man in the car on his private property. So um, I expect teenagers in parts of New York, certainly I didn't grow up, I grew up in the city, but in upstate New York and in places across the country, um, I'm sure there are teenagers and adults having sex in cars and parks, et cetera. Um, and no one's arresting that. But in the 1970s and through much of the 1980s, the police were targeting places where they knew gay men, and particularly young gay men, uh, the rambles in Central Park, um, parts of Fire Island, notwithstanding it's perceived to be as a gay place, there would be sting operations. Um, so in Anafri, defendants were arrested. The defendant was arrested. He said, yeah, you want to see the pictures? I'm gay. That's the guy. I know. But, but that's what he did. Um, and the case went up. Uh, the appellate division 
found that the statute was unconstitutional. The case went up to the Court of Appeals, and as you've already heard, um, the statute was declared unconstitutional. There was a vigorous dissent, two-judge dissent, and I want to, um, because I know there are others to speak, just, and I'm happy to talk about a sort of more recent work I've been doing around issues of transgender uh, sports limitation for girls. Um, but I want to, when I reread the case for today, um, I had a very chilling reaction. This decision, and I don't want to leave saying I think that, that people will be arrested all over New York for consensual sodomy. I'm not suggesting that. But what grounds this decision are the following cases. Roe v. Wade, Griswold v. Connecticut, Eisenstadt versus Bayer, and the concept that individuals have a protected zone of privacy, a penumbra of rights in the area of sexual decision making, control over procreation, control over family formation, and control over what you do with your body as a consenting adult. That is the foundation of this case. Now, there is also an equal protection holding um, in which the court says because consensual sodomy was legal for married couples, but for unmarried couples, gay or straight, it was not. It just happened no unmarried straight couples were ever arrested for consensual sodomy in New York at the time. But when I read the dissenting opinion for today, what the dissenting opinion, and it is a dissent, so I know better than to rely on it, talks about is whether the state has an interest in promoting morality, in promoting traditional relationships, in deciding who can form a family and who cannot, and whether this is a function of the legislature and not courts to create rights. Um, Anafri and the cases that follow um, striking down sodomy laws across the country. I was involved in writing an amicus in, 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 in the case that was lost, and then obviously there was Lawrence. What happens to that foundation when the precedent on which it is built disappears? I leave for the constitutional law scholars. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, so I was the drag queen back in 1969 that got arrested at the Stonewall Inn. <laughs> Actually, I'm just I'm going to talk about you know um, the Brashi case, which was really the uh, turning point, uh, many believe, for uh, LGBTQ rights, particularly as it pertains to uh, marriage equality. Um, for those of you who don't know, Brashi uh, was a two gay men living together in a rent-controlled apartment. Uh, one of them had passed from AIDS, and the, uh, the partner sought to uh, continue living in that apartment, and the landlord said, uh, no, you're not family, uh, and only family can uh, uh, inherit the, the apartment. Inside baseball, when the case got assigned uh, uh, for dis after oral argument to who would write the decision, the community got very, very nervous because it was assigned to my dad, uh, Judge Vito Titone, and understand that he, he was a uh, Catholic from Staten, grew up in Queens, lived in Staten Island, went to St. John's Law School. Uh, when he first took the bench uh, back in the late 60s in the Supreme Court, he was actually known as the hanging judge. Um, so people were very, very concerned that this would be uh, the end of the Brashi case ending with uh, Judge Titone. What uh, people didn't know was that Judge Titone had a gay son, <laughs> uh, an openly gay son. People often ask me, did that influence my dad? And I'm going to tell you, no, it did not. Uh, my dad uh, uh, was actually 
remember he went to school with Mario Cuomo, who many people remember as the liberal lion. And that was his politics, his democratic politics were uh, actually very liberal uh, based. He also had uh, uh, people surrounded himself with uh, law clerks that were, in addition to being crazy smart and brilliant, uh, uh, also ha uh, had very liberal leanings. So while my dad grew up in Queens, he grew up from of that generation, he did not know gay people growing up. Even it, during his married life, he did not know gay people other than perhaps for my mother's hairdresser, uh, Mr. James, um, who you know fit the stereotype in his head of what a gay person looked like, a, a you know, flamboyant uh, um, hairdresser who would you know, introduce the women in the neighborhood to, to exotic things, exotic things like fondue. Uh, um, <laughs> but having a gay son, my dad also got to meet my gay friend, uh, a detective who had actually been shot on the job, a, uh, a fire department uh, uh, chief who had been injured on the job carpenters, uh, construction workers, and he really grew to love these people, uh, not only for who they were, but because he got a lot of free work done at his summer <laughs> home by people who really knew what they were doing and certainly uh, um, dressed really well while doing it. So I think that when people ask me, did that influence my father? Yes, that it, it opened his mind, his eyes up to something other than the stereotype. When it came time to decide the Brashi case, uh, the chief judge actually had recused himself, uh, uh, Saul Wachler at the time, so that there, there were only six judges now, and they needed definitely to have that majority in order for it to pass. That deciding vote came from Judge Bellicosa. Now, this is really inside, super inside baseball, so, you know, turn off the TV and cameras because I'm going to tell you what happened behind closed doors at the Court of Appeals. Judge Bellicosa was actually a, more conservative than uh, Judge Titone, also went to St. John's, but also had friends in the church who were pressuring him. They knew if any other judges were to not uh, uh, vote on this case, they would have to go to the third department for that deciding vote. And every per person on that, in the third department at that time would be a decided hard no on the Brashi case. So my dad had to negotiate with a, a Judge Bellicosa. <laughs> and the negotiations went on. And then finally, it was really late one night that uh, Judge Bellicosa actually called my dad and said, listen, Vito, I can vote yes, but we have to do limitations on this. We really have to limit it to simply, you know, this one case, this, you know, just limit it to rent control laws. Now, my dad being a, a rather clever, decided to say to Joe, of course, Joe, we can do that, knowing that once the genie was out of the bottle, the genie was out of the bottle. And Judge Bellicosa would also tell you at this point, he only made that condition to appease political allies out in Queens who were strict Catholics uh, uh, that, of that nature. And he knew once the genie was out of the bottle that the rest would follow. And sure enough, once the court ruled that a gay couple living together, same-sex couple living together, were a family, the rest would eventually follow. We did not know how long it would take uh, since the Brashi case, but certainly as you look at the progression of LGBTQ rights, it certainly centers upon what is a family? How do we define a family in this society? And so Brashi was that, that deciding factor there. So um, I'm looking forward to taking questions because I also have a lot of inside baseball of the politics that occurred um, when we passed marriage equality back in 2011. And that was a, um, that was an interesting uh, uh, time and I'm so happy to have lived it, to have been through the halls of, of the state capitol when you have two opposing uh, protesting crowds. I mean, we're talking mobs of people and really vehemently opposed to the other side. One, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the right wing uh, uh, Catholics and Christians who, and 
Orthodox Jews who, for re religious reasons, did not want marriage to go through. And then, you know, the LGBTQ community and our allies who saw it as a civil rights issue. What people didn't realize that as contentious as this was, they were the sweetest groups of people together. They were singing songs together. They were offering each other water together. They were feeding each other, but they were protesting very vehemently against each other. And at one point they had the legislature laughing because the gays would be singing, we're going to the chapel and we're, and the Christians would be like, no, you're not, no, but, but all keeping the beat. So it was like actually pretty, you know, pretty amusing when you think about it. Um, but I'm gonna turn it over to, to Robbie at this juncture. I just wanted to give you a little brief inside baseball and uh, uh, I look forward to questions afterwards. So thank you all and thank you all for having us and for doing this, really appreciate it. Uh, let me begin uh, by say something about Roz Richter, um, because you didn't hear it come from her, but I'm sure everyone in this room has figured it out, and I'm just going to say it, so the elephant in the room is out, which is Roz Richter doing what she did when she did it was one of the bravest human beings on the planet. Um, I started my career at Paul Weiss in 1991, and I wasn't out to most people at Paul Weiss when I started. That's 1991. The idea that Roz had the inner strength and fortitude and guts and chutzpah to do what she did with the other people at Lambda when she, as she talked about is something that never ceases to amaze me. And without people like Roz having done what they did, the generation that followed Roz, my generation never could have achieved anything. There's just no question. We stand on such huge shoulders um, for, for a very little Jewish lady. <laughs> um, right back at you. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to say when I said this to Matt is I, I clerked for Judge Kay a few years after Hank in 1995, 1996. And Judge Kay, who was very busy running the court system for most of the time, um, when she got to Albany, really had to work very hard because she had to catch up on all the cases that she'd been too busy to kind of focus on when she'd been uh, in chambers in New York. And she had, how should we put it, kind of a practice, shall we say, that no one was really supposed to leave the courthouse at night until she left. Um, that could often be very, very late at night, often midnight, sometimes later than midnight. Um, I, on the other hand, often managed to finish my work on those days up in session in Albany by 10, 10.30 at night. And I would kind of be thinking to myself, what am I gonna do? Why am I gonna kill the next hour and a half or so before Judge Kay leaves? And my solution to that problem was hanging out with Matt's father. <laughs> um, we both knew what we were doing. We were both very clear to see when Judge Kay was leaving so I could leave. But I spent untold hours sitting with Judge Titone hearing him tell political war stories about New York politics that I just ate up like it was candy. Um, he had a nickname for me. He somehow thought I was like Barbara Streisand, which is insane, but he called me Bubbala. Um, and I still have in my- me too. <laughs> <laughs> and I still have in my office a bottle of champagne that we drank together at the end of my clerkship. And it, it, they're really some of the most cherished memories I have. Um, and of course it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be okay not to mention uh, my clerkship for Judge Kay and what a huge role she had, um, as I'll go through in, in some of these issues. One of the very first people I spoke to after the Windsor decision came down on June 26, 2013 was Judge Kay, um, who called in absolute um, joy um, to tell me how proud of me she was. And then we both kind of just fell over each other on the phone for a few minutes. And then I went on to do the other stuff we were doing that day. I also want to say that uh, Hank rightly called this uh, gathering today, this session, a celebration. And that's the right term. Um, the progress in LGBT civil rights from the period that Roz talked about till today was, relatively speaking, the most, the fastest, most dramatic, most significant civil rights progress in our nation's history. 
Um, there are a lot of reasons we could talk about why that is so, and I'm not certainly going to suggest that that's that, that African-American civil rights or other civil rights groups shouldn't have moved equally as quickly, that, but they did not. Um, the success that the LGBTQ rights movement achieved based on the work of people like Roz is truly extraordinary, both in, in depth and in speed. Um, but Roz was also right, and I'm, I'm trying to get out of this Debbie Downer mode lately, so I, my friend Dahlia Lithwick and I keep having little therapy sessions to cheer each other up, but it, it would be inaccurate, I think, for people to assume that that movement is just going to continue and that there isn't going to be significant, significant pushback and probably in other states significant, significant uh, regression in the rights that have already been achieved. Um, the Dobbs draft released, um, however it was released, by Justice Alito um, contains language that is absolutely nearly word for word identical with the language that Justice Alito wrote in his dissents in Windsor and his dissent in Obergefell. And while Justice Alito has a sentence to say this is just about abortion because it just relates to fetuses, he has no other rationale to explain why his prior opinions, trashing substantive due process, trashing the creation of new rights by the court, et cetera, uh, relying heavily on what he believes to be the views of the founders and what the founders thought in the 18th century when they were drafting the Constitution. He has no rationale for explaining how that is going to somehow become out differently when it comes to LGBT rights or contraception or a host of other issues. Um, these are dark days. I'm just going to be frank. These are dark, dark days at the Supreme Court. Um, and at least I'm going to have to rely on all the people here who are younger than me, because at least in my generation, I don't think the composition of the Supreme Court is going to change. Um, and, and in the work that we do today, most of what we do is try to avoid the Supreme Court um, and to get legislation passed in the legislatures or elsewhere, rather than relying on the courts, sadly, to show and to uh, vindicate the promise of the Constitution, whether it's the state constitution or the federal constitution. Let me go a little bit then, let me just go quickly and kind of talk about the cases and where I've touched um, LGBT, right, LGBT rights in New York. The first case uh, is Matter of Jacob. Uh, Matter of Jacob was a case about second parent adoption. Um, and I was clerking for Judge Kay at the time. Um, I was closeted, again, another feature of my relative should I say lack of courage and Roz's astounding courage, I was closeted to Judge Kay at the time. She did not know I was a lesbian. Um, and it was a hardly, a, a really hardly contested case, hardly fought not only among the adversaries, but without getting too much into the inner court politics, ha fought, really harshly contested on the Court of Appeals itself, such that, and this is ironic, uh, Judge Kay at one point took to hiding memoranda that Justice Bellicosa was sending. Um, he ultimately dissented in the case from me because she knew that if I saw the memoranda, I would get so upset that I would go get, get crazy about it. So she literally, I'd be like, well, where's the memo from Justice Bellicosa? She'd be like, what memo? And I was like, what do you mean, what memo? Um, so it, it was a very, very tense time. The court held, the, well, what's the, the question of the case? The question was second parent adoption. Could the case, Justice Bellicosa, who was running these issues for the court at the time, consolidated two cases together, whether an unmarried man and woman and another case with two unmarried women could adopt a child. Um, and uh, it was one of the very few cases, I think, that this, the Court of Appeals, Hope would know, have ever held over uh, until the fall. It was the one argument Judge Kay and I ever had. Uh, it was not about, she, she kept saying to me, well, we'll never get another vote. And I said, it's not about getting another vote, but we could write a better dissent. And somehow I managed to convince her to hold it over to give us time to write a better dissent. Uh, and sometime during the election law session, as I recall in August, uh, Judge Levine with Alicia Ouellette as his law clerk um, changed their vote to vote for second parent adoption. Um, there's a funny story about that because when Alicia called me to tell me we were in chambers in New York and I started screaming um, with joy, apparently there was a meeting of the appellate division justices at the time in the room next door. And they said to Judge Kay, what's going on in the room next door? And she said, oh, that's just my law clerk, Robbie. <laughs> um, uh, but it's really interesting to think about what that case was about because at that point in time, 
Brashi had a huge impact on the matter of Jacob. Well, I don't think we would have gotten the result that we got in that case without Brashi. Um, but the, the constitutional rights that were discussed in that case, which is how we brought Justice Levine over, Judge Levine over, were the constitutional rights not of the gay people, but of the, of the kid. The idea was that it would be in, in, improper, inappropriate, and unfair to treat a kid with two, with two lesbian moms as not having all the protections of two parents, whereas kids of straight parents had that option. And because gay people could marry at that time, it was unfair to, to penalize the child that way. And that's how the case was decided, really based on the constitutional rights of the child. Um, the next case I dealt with in New York was the Hernandez case, which you heard a lot about already, uh, with a trial decision by Doris Ling Cohen. Um, at this point, my life is very different. So um, I was certainly out to Judge K by then. Um, um, I um, had, I, when we decided, when Matter of Jacob was decided by the court, I had no inkling that I would ever have a child or ever be able to get married or have or have that kind of family. By the time Hernandez Samuels came down in 2006, my son was born, I think, about a month later, a month earlier, excuse me, and my wife and I had been married in Toronto, recognized in New York uh, that fall. Um, and what was the strategy in that case? Our strategy really was, frankly, Excelsior. Um, the argument that I made, unsuccessfully, <laughs> but the argument, thanks to, to Judge Smith, who had been my partner, Paul Weiss, but the argument I made unsuccessfully was that the court should be brave, that there was a, a proud tradition, I argued, you heard some of that in Judge, Judge Kay's dissent, in New York of recognizing uh, privacy rights with respect to people and to how they arrange their families, relying on a no fray, and that there was a clear line of cases, I thought, and we argued, where the New York courts, unlike other state courts, had recognized this area of personal domestic privacy and equal protection, and that the court should be brave. It should join the very few states at that time. It was just Massachusetts, uh, the, Supreme, the decision by the Supreme Judicial Court, argued by Barry Bonato, of course, and there was a civil union statute, as I recall, in, in Connecticut, but that was it. And so we were asking New York to take a lead, to take the lead, to be the next state to come on board. And sadly, as everyone knows, I lost that case pretty badly. Um, but the one amazing thing about Hernandez is what was pointed to in the dissent. Um, Bob, I mean, excuse me, in the majority, Bob Smith said, go to the legislature. If you had told me in 2006 that five years later, in 2011, the New York legislature would actually pass marriage equality, I would have, you could have pushed me over with a, with a feather. I would have said you were completely insane and you were either drinking too much or smoking too much marijuana, for sure. Um, and, and, and here's an area, and you heard others talk about this. Here's an area, and I know it's controversial, but where Governor Cuomo, for all his faults and for all his controversies, some of which I got wrapped up in, um, deserves credit. It, it was an, also an act of bravery and conscience. Um, he knew that he had to pressure a lot of people to get that done. He was willing to do that. And it's something that, again, up until that point, no other governor of any other state had, had been able to accomplish. So let's talk about Edie Windsor, which is the, the last New York case that I handled. What was interesting about Edie's case, well, first of all, Edie was a classic, had a classic New York story in the sense that she'd been born in Philadelphia, um, she got married to her brother's friend in Philadelphia. Um, she told her husband after about less than a year that he, he deserved to have something better for himself, and so did she. And she moved to New York City, literally, like me and like many other people, in order to be gay, like we heard from, from Chris as well. Um, and when... The story of her marriage is that her, her spouse, Thea Spire, who I sadly think does not get spoken of enough today, Thea had a huge, huge impact in this. But Thea um, lived her life, she had progressive multiple sclerosis over her life, and, and she became progressively paralyzed. And it, by a certain point, she was essentially a paraplegic. And they had been talking about getting married, but travel for Thea was very, very, very hard. And they were kind of waiting for New York to pass marriage. Again, the way that our cases and the legislature impact real lives. But at a certain point in time, 
Thea got a diagnosis from her doctor because of a heart condition that she only had about a year to live. She woke up the next morning and she said to Edie, do you want to go to Toronto and get married? Are you still want to get married? Edie said, I do. And they uh, flew to Toronto, the same place I got married, and were married to, sh to show kind of how badly they want to get married in the airport hotel connected to the airport so that Thea's wheelchair could be kind of wheeled right into the conference room where they were married. Um, the amazing story here is the radical way that the world changed even at, while that case was pending. So in, tw in 29, when they got married, uh, Thea died in, tw in late 29, we filed in early 2010, um, they had to go to Toronto. And, and as you heard, New York did recognize marriages and at one point, I was a master of the common law rules of marriage recognition. I no longer am. Um, but while New York recognized the marriage, New York did not allow marriages to take place in New York. As the case was pending in 2011, that changed. That was a huge bonus for the case, obviously. Um, and by the time I argued Windsor at the Supreme Court in 2013, I think my answer to Justice Scalia, if I'm correct, was 13 states. Uh, were allowing gay, gay couples to marry. And by the time the decision came down in late June, I think it was close to 26, something like that. So again, think about the speed. Just within the life of the Windsor case, from Edie having to go to Toronto, to marriage in New York, to 13 states, to 26 states. And then after Windsor was decided, and this is something that also still amazes me, I think, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, the very first state to say that Windsor compelled marriage equality was Utah. Correct. So it'll give you a sense of the trajectory uh, that happened here. Um, so, and then Obergefell, of course, uh, came two years later. It's interesting to know that Windsor itself was only an equal protection case. Edie, our, our position in Edie, which was correct, is that she was, I kept saying in our prep, she's already married. She's definitely gay and she's already married. So we didn't have a due process claim because she's already married and the question was, should she have the same equal protection of federal law that gay married couples, uh, that straight married couples do? Um, so that again takes us to where we are today. Um, I think, or I fear I should say, that like the situation uh, with abortion, where I think everyone assumes that New York will essentially become kind of a sanctuary state uh, for women who live in states that prohibit abortion to be able to come here and either get the morning after pill or get other medical attention, uh, um, which is outlawed and sometimes even criminalized in their own states. I fear that a situation like that will happen with respect to LGBT rights. And I shouldn't say will happen. In fact, it already is happening. Um, I don't know if anyone saw, I certainly don't watch it very often, but I, my client, Xander Moritz, was on Good Morning America, I think it was the day before yesterday. Uh, he's a high school, uh, he was a high school senior in Florida at a school for gifted students. Uh, he was accepted at practically every college he applied, and I failed in convincing him to go to Brown, so he's going to Harvard. Um, and at his high school graduation, he was told that as a result of a law passed by Governor DeSantis, colloquially known as the Don't Say Gay Law, he was not permitted at his speech to say anything in his commencement speech about being gay, about his activism, or about the lawsuit that we filed. Uh, Xander, being the incredibly clever kid that he is, um, instead gave a speech uh, with a euphemism about his curly hair. And if you watch the video, it's online, he took off his cap and showed his curly hair, and he said, I have had to deal in Florida with the fact that I've had curly hair. Uh, it's been very hard to deal with. I've really tried to straighten it. I wasn't able to straighten it. Um, having curly hair is really hard given the humidity in Florida, and I'm really worried for kids after me who have curly hair and what will happen to them. Uh, he got a standing ovation um, at his commencement ceremony, which was lovely and something he was worried about. Uh, but that didn't win the case. Um, and the fact that states like Florida, Alabama, and others are willing to have governors who are so cruel, and legislatures who are so cruel, that they want to tell not only amazing high school seniors like Xander, who's got an incredible, a really bright future ahead of him, but going back to the DiStefano case, young kids of lesbian moms 
that they're not allowed in school to talk about who their parents are, that they're not allowed to draw a picture of their family in kindergarten and first grade, that there's to be no classroom discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity, those are the exact statutory terms, is something just like if you told me, just like I said, if you told me after um, Hernandez that we would have gotten gay marriage passed through the legislature in New York five years, I would have told you you were nuts. If you told me after Windsor or certainly after Obergefell that we have laws like this sprouting up through the United States over and over again, I would have also said you're nuts. Uh, so the battle's not over. There's a lot more fighting ahead. And fortunately for us, I believe that the vast majority of that fighting will take place out of the great state of New York. Thank you. Well, in the spirit of uh, the celebration tonight uh, of uh, the extraordinary transformation to the good of American jurisprudence, I will say one quick thing as a witness to the Brashy case uh, about how courts can surprise you. I was a law clerk for Judge Kaye in 1989 when Brashy got to the court, and I could do simple math, and it was a six-judge court because Judge Wachler recused himself. And at that point, it was my third year on the court, so I thought I had a pretty good idea where court, where the judges would land. And when the case was argued, before they conferenced it, um, and Judge Kaye came back to chambers, I counted of the six judges only two. Uh, that would find for the petitioner in that case, Judge Alexander and Judge Kay. Now, Judge Tatone was a very progressive judge, in addition to being the most lovable judge on the court, uh, and Judge Kay would agree with me if she was here, much that I loved her, um, was a very progressive judge, but I'm sitting there, and I think Judge Kay thought his way, no way, no way, no reflection at all on, I see Hal Kennedy on Staten Island, but no way. And Judge Bellicosa on social issues was very conservative. And in 1989, it seemed relevant, devoutly religious, a daily communicant. And I thought, no way. And Judge Simons and Judge Hancock, Republicans from upstate New York, I thought to myself, great judges, great judges, no way. And when Judge Kay came back from conference, me and my co-clerk, uh, who uh, today is openly gay, uh, but at the time, not so much, um, uh, she came back and she said, three votes and judge to tone, delirium. We didn't yell as loud as you. <laughs> delirium, three. We didn't know how we'd get the fourth. And then I would say to Judge Bellicosa, I think it was his finest hour as a judge. I think Judge Bellicosa, uh, that was maybe the hardest vote he ever cast given. And he just needed cover. He just needed cover. Yeah, yeah. yeah but. Courts can surprise you, uh, uh, although the U.S. Supreme Court hasn't surprised me in quite a while. <laughs> Could we talk just a little bit about legislation um, and, 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 and the 2011 victory to me as an observer, an Albanian of the state legislature was a surprise, not because of the assembly, but because the state senate was then in Republican control. Uh, and you were in the legislature, Judge Tatone. Yeah. Do you have any insight you could share with us about that? Yeah, and, and Robbie and I were, were talking a little bit about that. And it really comes down to, uh, uh, for all his faults, uh, uh, then Governor Cuomo's uh, uh, really resolved um, to have this done uh, that year. Um, but we also have to thank there were there were four Republican state senators that actually voted for it. And you have to remember back then, you had Mike Long, who was the uh, chair of the New York State Conservative Party, threatening every single legislature, uh, Republican or otherwise, that if they voted for marriage equality, that they would not get the conservative endorsement, that in fact the conservative party would um, campaign against them and that they would basically be political toast um, within their districts. So for, for many people uh, led us in the Senate, particularly uh, outside of New York City, the conservative party line is the lifeline to winning your election. There were four, and I, for, I forgot their names, I know one was Elisi, um, 
Miller, Doc Miller, who was in the assembly before, and, and two others uh, who actually said to the Conservative Party that, it, you know, F you basically, and they knew that they were going to lose their jobs, they were going to lose their elections because of the, their vote, uh, and they really, it was a vote of conscience for them. So that was interesting. What also what was interesting is that there were several bills for marriage equality before uh, the 2011 uh, uh, vote. In the assembly, Dick Gottfried uh, had, had a bill and he had carried that for many, many years uh, until uh, Danny O'Donnell was elected uh, uh, to the assembly and then Danny O'Donnell had, 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 had a bill. And so it was really interesting to get Dick Gottfried to drop his bill and to let the openly gay legislators carry this bill rather than to have him do it. So, so that was an interesting negotiation. And basically it came down to, look, Dick, you know, the gay community has been knocked down over and over and over again. And over and over and over again, the gay community picks itself up. Uh, uh, we appreciate your friendship. We appreciate the allies. But this is something we need to do for ourselves. And I think that's the argument where Dick Gottfried uh, relinquished control of the uh, marriage equality bill, gave it over to Danny O'Donnell. And if you look at the, you know, the sponsors of the bill, it's O'Donnell, Gottfried, Glick, to, and then it goes into the gay people and then to, into the allies. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of uh, sausage making when that happened, but really it was the will of Governor Cuomo to really get this done this year, um, 2011, and to really put it to bed knowing that once New York State did uh, marriage equality, that other states, the smaller states, would follow easily, and that's exactly what did happen. Uh, uh, Christopher, um, rightly so, Justice Richter, one of the extraordinary heroes in the judiciary and amongst lawyers in courtrooms in the legislature in the pre-marriage equality period. Any heroes that stick to mind that we should remember? You know, I think in many ways, and, and Judge, you had mentioned you know, Senator Alisi, um, I think it was Saland, uh, who was put on the public. And, and the way that uh, Cuomo did this is, is none of them were getting elected again. But as we all know, there are lots of places to put people in New York. So he put people in lots of places, some of which are, they're, they're still at. But I think I'm actually going to give a surprising answer. Um, and this is not an answer that people would expect. Joe Bruno, who famously ran the state Senate, Republican, was a surprising, surprising ally at times to the community. Now, I want to be very clear, there were lots of times he was not. But there were times where a DOMA, a state DOMA, Defense of Marriage Act would come up and Joe Bruno would say, there's absolutely no way we're ever having that in New York State. There was a time where Senator Tom Duane asked for benefits for partners in the state Senate and Joe Bruno said, it's never happening. And then he let it happen. He didn't care. There are political wins at play. Of course, there were questions at play. And this is part of Albany politics. But I bring him up because there are a lot of other unsung moments where it's not always the folks you expect that actually do sometimes help, at least in the Albany world, move balls forward. Because every little legislative achievement, and I count those as legislative achievements, are legislative achievements. And especially when they cross the aisle, and especially when, when it's not what you expect. Um, and there's so many folks that made a big difference. But I only bring up um, him in particular, because time and time again, interviewing him and, and folks around him, I was constantly taken aback by the little things that he would do or not do in order to kind of surprisingly make a difference for the LGBTQ community. Yeah, I just want to uh, dovetail on that when you talk about you know leadership. Um, and the surprises, one of the surprises, first of all, was uh, uh, the former speaker, the, uh, the late Sh Shelley Silver. Think of him what, what you may, but he was an Orthodox Jewish man, very strict Orthodox Jewish man, under extraordinary pressure from the Orthodox community not to have uh, 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 the bill come to the floor. And yet he permitted it to come to the floor and he voted in favor of it. So 
so yeah, that was a surprise too. That 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 Sheldon Silver even allowed the bill to come to the floor for a vote. Um, I know we're talking about history, but just looking into the future on the subject of legislation and uh, uh, Robbie, Justice Richter, any new frontiers in terms of laws or statutes, positive, good ones that we should come to think about or in the future? So all that I know, Hank, is that the New York legislatures now and, and Governor Hochul are, are thinking very seriously about what laws they can do to protect uh, women, as I said before, who want to travel to New York to get an abortion. Um, legally speaking, my partners and I have been thinking about this quite a lot, and it's literally there's no precedent for it since the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, it is likely that the level of interstate controversy about both for both civil liability and criminal liability for women who travel across state lines is going to be unprecedented again, other than the disputes that states had over runaway fugitive slaves. Um, I know that New York is thinking about what it can do um, and what legislation it can pass to better protect doctors who perform those kinds of abortions and the women who get uh, uh, care in New York. And if, I hope I'm wrong, but if I'm right that similar legislation succeeds and kind of grows in the area of LGBT rights, I think New York will also have to think about what it could do to protect uh, LGBT kids um, who come here, just like we've all heard about before, but who come here and how to protect them um, so that um, the laws of Texas or Alabama or other states don't impinge on their ability to live fulfilling lives, especially for kids who are underage. So I'm just gonna build on that. Um, one of my concerns um, are the laws that are making it impossible to provide medical care, including hormones, any kind of counseling, suicide prevention to transgender or gender questioning youth um, and it's going to be a particular issue for young people who have already transitioned um, because without getting into all the science the, the health risks of up to your heart to, besides the psychological ones of literally one day being told you can't get hormones and so similarly um, you know a lot of people practice in New York Insurance companies are here. Uh, how are we going to provide medical care to someone who comes here and has to come regularly? That's one. And then um, there, there are questions that, that are coming up uh, about whether people who have not, who have gotten married, lesbian or gay, had children in the course of the marriage, but do not have second parent adoptions, how those parental rights will be recognized as those couples travel to states um, where we didn't have that issue before. And, and so I think there, there is a discussion whether New York could potentially make it a little bit more user friendly to get a second parent adoption right now, it still requires a lawyer and money and uh, things like that. So, so I think that's a, it, it, that's a litigation issue, not necessarily a legislation issue, um, but I think it is, it is coming. Uh, another subject is the uh, related, uh, is the relationship between religious freedom and the United States Supreme Court's increasingly broad, if not absolutist, interpretation of the Free Exercise Clause and LGBTQ rights, and how we balance or accommodate those when they come into conflict uh, or tension. Any thoughts about that? Um, well, the current justice on the Supreme Court, um, with the exception of Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, and soon-to-be Jackson, um, all have a very strong and consistent view on free exercise in the context of public accommodation, particularly in the context of LGBT rights. Um, so while the masterpiece cake decision 
which was handed down a couple years ago when Kennedy was still on the court, was kind of a compromise. It was basically limited to the facts, kind of the way you were talking about Ambrashi. Um, that compromise, I think, is about to be overridden. Um, and you saw it in the Philadelphia adoption case. There are more cases coming uh, that will come to the court. And I think it's pretty clear uh, that uh, public accommodation laws that currently prevent discrimination against black people and gay people going forward will only apply with respect to black people if someone has a religious objection to LGBT people. Um, that's kind of a nutty result. Um, I freely acknowledge it's a nutty result, but I think, again, unless there's some drastic change to the composition of the court, uh, that's the way the law is headed. Um, apropos of, of that, I, uh, Christopher, I know you're very active writing amicus briefs and, 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 and different involvement in litigation, including the Supreme Court. Um, this general subject, not necessarily free exercise versus LGBTQ rights, but the relationship between businesses and individuals who um, are, are not protective of those concerns. Could you talk a little bit about your involvement? You know, I think it's super important to be conscious of this, especially now, and, and Robbie put it really perfectly. <clears throat> In so many ways, this is at the really heart of what we need to start thinking about and looking at when it comes to litigation and, and legislation, um, whether that's looking at the First Amendment issues that, that Robbie is currently litigating, whether it's looking at the free speech issues, the free exercise issues. I know at the moment uh, I'm working on a draft on behalf of the New York State Bar Association in the big case that's going before the Supreme Court next term about public accommodations. And, and in some ways, we have to start thinking about how this balance may look and how we talk about this balance to the justices that, that think about history and tradition and custom in a way that, that doesn't necessarily dovetail with the progress that has been made in the LGBTQ rights space. It's, it's what I would say to my students is legal realism. We have to be realistic and then start to address realistically where we are. Um, and, and, and in many ways, that's not always the easiest thing to do. It's actually part of what makes lawyering, I, I would say, both fun but also challenging to try to come up with ways to, to unpack uh, some of these more difficult questions. I will say this, though, um, and I think that, that this is something that was very heartening writing the book. Um, one of the things that we did while writing the book on the history of the marriage equality movement was talk with religious leaders across the country. And religion has changed in the last 50 years as much as anything else, as much as the family has changed, as much as the constitutional theories that surround family and, and law have changed. And, and one of my most interesting and favorite stories to study are the ways in which Utah actually has served as a really unique place when it comes to finding ways where compromise might be possible between religious freedom and LGBTQ rights. And I'm not saying that there's any perfection, in fact, quite the opposite. But I do think that when it comes to lots of complex constitutional uh, concepts that are in, in, in uh, grappling with one another, we do have to think broadly, and, and I appreciate it. I mean, there's folks in the room and folks who are watching today who are part of the process of writing this brief, and, and I think we're all trying to think broadly about how do we start to address a court that, as I think, I think, Robbie, you mentioned it, you know, is not going to change tomorrow necessarily from a composition standpoint. So where do we address these things? Do we address them at the state level? Because that's part of what you do as a lawyer. You look at the various options. Um, but as cases keep ending up there, we're gonna to have to keep managing and thinking through these complex topics. And, and one of them's coming right around the bend and there's gonna be more than that. You know, one other thing, Hank, one thing that really puts, in my view, and I'm, I'm just out there at this point because of all the stuff that's happening in the world today. One of the things that really, I think, puts a lie to the conservative justice's originalism is the flip side of the free exercise clause, which is the establishment clause. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Establishment Clause today is virtually non-existent, at least when it comes to Christianity. It doesn't really have so much power when it comes to Muslim, Islam or other religions, but when it comes to Christianity, um, the Establishment Clause basically doesn't exist. Governmental institutions are now being permitted to openly exhibit, and we'll see it, in the, and I think in the coaching 
prayer case, the coach who said the prayers after the football games, that that's going to be okay. There's going to be very little um, endorsement of Christianity in public accommodation or governmental institutions that will not be okay. Um, and that, if you look back at what the founders thought, and I've actually read this stuff, they really believed in the Establishment Clause. I mean, that was a big deal for starting this country and passing the Bill, Bill of Rights. Even people in Virginia, even Madison, was a huge believer in the Establishment Clause. So it, it really, I think, kind of highlights the highly politicized and ideological agenda that they're really pursuing, as opposed to the kind of excuse they would give that it's all about originalism or literalism um, or textualism. So Robbie, could you tell us a little bit about um, your uh, litigation in Florida, the challenge to the don't say gay law uh, and, and, and the like? Sure. So um, several weeks ago, the Florida legislature really being pushed by Governor DeSantis uh, passed a law uh, the relevant portion of which that we are challenging basically is very simple in, in language. It's very non-simple when it comes to how it should be interpreted. But it basically says that there should be no classroom discussion or instruction, those are the two nouns that are used, about gender identity or sexual orientation, um, none at all, grades K through three, and grades four through 12 only as developmentally appropriate. Um, we argue in, well, let me say one more thing, that that's, that's all the statute says. I mean, I'm saying that for a reason. There is no definition. There is no attempt at explanation. Um, I am not a fan for a whole bunch of other reasons of Florida's Stop Woke Law, which they passed around the same time. But the Stop Woke Law has eight very specific theories or beliefs that it believes should not be taught in the Florida schools. And when you hold up the two statutes together, they are day and night. Um, we argue in the case, we basically have three arguments. One, that we believe the vagueness of the law was intentional, um, that the legislatures did not want people to understand what was prohibited by the law. Could a kid in, in kindergarten or first grade draw a picture of his two moms? Could a kid like Xander at his high school commencement talk about the fact that he was gay? They wanted people to not be able to answer that question because the result of that is that people would be chilled from saying anything. And that's exactly what's happening. So that's a due process clause violation, we believe, under the US Constitution. The second argument we make is a free speech argument, as you can imagine. Um, the free speech rights of students, which are still, at least for now, <laughs> constitutionally protected, are being impinged in terms of their inability to say even who they are or who their parents are. Teachers also have First Amendment rights, but under the precedent, they're not as robust. Um, and three, uh, an equal protection violation. We say in the legislative record on this, as you can imagine, is very good, that this was done for the specific purpose of shaming, humiliating uh, gay kids or kids of gay parents, making them feel, or trans kids, or making them feel lesser than. And at least under Justice Kennedy's jurisprudence, which may or may not last. If you pass a law for that basis, it violates the Equal Protection Clause. So those are the arguments. We're actually filing our amended complaint. That's why I keep checking my phone. Um, it's due tonight. Um, we have a trial date of February 13. Um, you guys will hear it here first. One of the announcements we're making in our complaint is we're no longer seeking a preliminary injunction unless something happens to one of the plaintiffs that requires it. But we think it's more efficient to just proceed to a February 13 trial date, um, and we are going to go to trial in uh, Tallahassee, Florida, about the constitutionality of the statute. Justice Richter, at least in terms of your work today, but looking into the future, what do you think the next waves of litigation are? Where is the cutting edge? Um, well, I think, some, frankly, it's also in Florida. Um, I and my law firm and co-counsel with HRC, we are litigating in Florida on behalf of a middle school student whose initials, I can't give out her name, or DN, um, who um, is a amazingly brave transgender girl who wants to play girls soccer, um, also in Florida, and can't. Um, and our case has been sua sponte stayed. We had a trial date, actually, it would have been in about two weeks. 
Um, but the trial judge has sua sponte stayed the case pending a en banc ruling from the 11th Circuit as to whether schools can have gender neutral bathrooms for transgender students. Um, and, the, and so I think uh, what's going on with transgender youth across the country is definitely the cutting edge classrooms. And, and maybe just to add, because um, I sort of went back and said, like, what cases did I work on? And one of them back in 1983 was a case out of Oklahoma in the 10th Circuit, um, which at the time made it um, almost identical to Florida, prohibited a public or private homosexual conduct by teachers. Um, and there again, so I think uh, we're going to see a wave of teacher cases, um, not just transgender, but, but um, the, the, the case law on what teachers can or cannot say in classrooms, it's not to be Debbie Downer myself, <laughs> um, but, but I think that, that sort of this idea that, that we, who are out or allies are recruiting um, really is coming up like loud across the country. The, the, the Governor DeSantis' press secretary called the Don't Say Gay law an anti-groomer law. Wow. Groomer law. And so we have a teacher plaintiff who says he's scared to tell kids he's a gay man been teaching 29 years about that he's married to a man because some parents gonna accuse him of grooming and like the Texas abortion law, the way you enforce the don't say gay law is it gives any parent in the district with a kid in the, in the school district the ability to sue the school district for violation of the law. So you're, you have, you know, parent bounty hunters coming after teachers and school personnel and other school personnel. So we have about 10 minutes left and I would love to open it up to this distinguished audience for any questions that you have. Um, there are three microphones in front. Just walk up to the microphone and introduce yourself, and please feel free to ask the panelists any question that you might have. Hi, uh, Adrian Untermeyer here. Um, I think Judge Slipman was right. A ground-shaking panel, so thanks to all of you, especially my old boss, uh, Justice Richter. Um, so we just put out um, the history of the New York County courts recently, and the most fun part was going back and looking at the newspaper articles about those first marriages. Um, any memories um, anyone could share about presiding over those marriages, attending them, um, being at the altar themselves would be appreciated. Yes. Um, so I was um, in the group of judges who we all volunteered that day at the, the city clerk's office. Um, it was just fabulous. I mean, I have to say it was just one big party um, and, and, and so many people of a senior generation, people 60s, 70s, who came in, um, many with, chil with adult children um, saying they had waited their whole lives for this. Um, and, and for me, like that that was the most memorable was to see people who I could imagine just never thought this would happen. I think I saw someone coming. Yes, please go ahead. I've got such a wonderful group of Court of Appeals um, history buffs up here. One question I just am wondering if you all have thoughts on it might be pure speculation or, or, or also maybe just obvious, but um, why do you think your dad and Judge Bellicosa wouldn't join Judge Kay's dissent two years after Brashi and Allison D. Do you think the idea of gay parents was too, just too much, too, a bridge too far, even after writing such a beautiful opinion about gay families? I, I think for my dad, uh, I, I think he felt that he had um, went far enough and he still had, uh, um, I don't want to say constituency, but he still had his roots to to be true to the, you know, the St. John's, his religion. And I think for him, 
I don't think he could have taken the criticism yet again uh, uh, and the backlash that that did ensue after Brashi, particularly from uh, religious leaders. That's my guess. I, I've never discussed it with him. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Judge Caroline Cohen. I'm elected out of uh, King's Civil Court. Uh, so I actually had the pleasure of being taught by Paris Baldacci, who worked on the Brashi case, and he was really formative in my legal career. So actually, my question is really for Judge Titone, who offered up this inside baseball kind of That's perspective. Sure. I'm curious how the Koch administration really <laughs> played a role, if at all, in the Brashi litigation? I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't, I don't think that they played much of a role because we're talking about rent, uh, uh, rent control, rent stabilization, and for them it's just you know about a, a housing issue. But I, I don't recall any discussion as to what the local, you know, the mayors or city councils, what, what their reactions would be. Okay, thank you for that. And I actually have a part two regarding the um, influence that the Catholic Church attempted to wield throughout these decisions. Could you give a little more insight on to what specifically they attempted to do to lean on people? Well, well you, you, you saw it uh, particularly with, um, I can tell you from my personal experience, you know, as a, a politician uh, um, and elected official on Staten Island, um, I've actually had uh, a priest who is now deceased, uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, uh, actually from, from his pulpit on Sundays would preach against me in my dis district. So they're there, you know, not only just because of uh, my beliefs about marriage equality, but, but also be my beliefs on, on choice. So there are things like that. And you do get a lot of pressure. So, and the same with judges from where they're from and, and stuff like that. And remember, Staten Island, uh, uh, while parts of Staten Island are extraordinarily blue, some are extraordinarily purple, uh, we still have a St. Patrick's Day parade where gay groups are not allowed to march. And we're the only, it's the only parade in the world where gay groups are not allowed to march on St. Patrick's Day. So th there is that undertone of the roots of where you came from and your friends that you make along the way. And I think that was part of it. Thank you for that. For anyone who hasn't read it, I highly commend the New York Times feature about Ed Koch that came out of several weeks ago and him yeah, being a gay man. And the little New York tidbit is Ed Koch, Larry Kramer, and Edie Windsor all lived in the same building wow. uh, in Greenwich Village. Please. Uh, good evening. I'm John Barrett. Uh, thank you to each of you for your work and for this extraordinary panel, which is wonderful for all of us here and is an incredible resource that will live on through the Historical Society. Um, I've been a trustee of the Historical Society for a long time, and it gets primary credit. But I want to ask about bar associations, because here we are, and here we are as a profession. Um, historically, where were the bar associations as allies or as obstacles? And today, and for the future, what are your thoughts about what the bar association should be doing? So I, I can answer that. Um, the bar associations um, were invisible um, during the early days of the movement, but like much of the rest of the world, the AIDS epidemic, um, this Bar Association was one of the first uh, to have an AIDS in the law or to do work around AIDS. Um, and I also think, you know, maybe just as a historical perspective, uh, what, what changed, sort of I've thought about this for this program, what I think was a huge catalyst is, is that people got sick. And if you've seen the movie Philadelphia or any of the early it, it, it was a visible sickness, and it was, it was a rough time, and it was young associates and big firms suddenly having to come out, um, or their families. So I think now uh, this Bar Association is leading. Um, I was uh, on the committee, although I did not participate because I was a sitting judge, 
But the Bar Association in the mid 1990s, this association issued a report in support of gay marriage. So um, that's, uh, you know, more than a, a decade before it became law. So, and the state bar as well has been a big leader on this issue. Uh, Professor Barrett, just to introduce you to the rest of the audience, is truly one of the state and nation's preeminent legal historians, and uh, we're privileged to have him on the board. I say this as a past Bar Association president. I think Justice Richter is right in terms of the evolution of Bar Associations. The uh, City Bar was created in 1870, the State Bar in 1876. I think for the first hundred or so years of their history, you'd be hard pressed to find them on the whole and bar in large taking positions on cutting edge social justice issues. However, in the last 25 years, there's clearly been uh, a change, a sea change. And uh, the city bar wrote a report, the state bar um, for its own internal history famously in 2009, issued a report that set forth a comprehensive legal analysis about this issue uh, urging the legislature before it acted in 2011. So you see, I think, the organized bar, including not just specialty bars, but broader bars getting more involved in these kinds of issues. So I think we have time for one more question uh, or so. Please, go ahead. Thank you. My name's Belina Anderson, and I clerked on central staff when Hank was one of uh, Judge Kay's clerks. You haven't changed a bit, Hank. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to ask the panel, I remember from uh, Judge Kay speaking at times about the possibility of the New York State Constitution and jurisprudence around the state constitution uh, being a way to, for New York to distinguish itself jurisprudentially. And if someone on the panel could speak about Brashi and Allison D and this suite of cases about privacy, whether the New York State Constitution um, can further advance these rights um, for people, and whether there are any other states that have that possibility as well. So, so Anofre was, as I recall, was a state constitutional case. Cool. Uh, many of the other cases, and, and Hernandez was argued strictly as a state constitutional case. We were not asserting any of these rights under the federal constitution. Um, Judge Kay, I, I, she was still into, the, into that when I clerked for her, was a great believer in the state constitution. And kind of the state constitutional movement arose at a time when there was a view that the S Supreme Court was becoming, was really retracting and retreating in terms of um, off extending rights to people kind of from the conversion from the Warren Court to the Rehnquist Court. Um, we are certainly at that time now. I mean, you know, in spades, like a lot worse right now. And I, and I predict that in states like Massachusetts decision 2003 was a, a Massachusetts state court decision. Um, if there are, if issues like this arise um, in the states that are protective of substantive due process, privacy rights, and family rights, if there is a need, courts in those states, I think, will rely uh, on their state constitutions. And in New York, of course, there's talk now of passing some version of a equal rights slash human rights amendment uh, that would essentially memorialize a lot of the changes that have happened either legislatively or by court decision into the New York Constitution itself. The problem is uh, to amend the New York Constitution is an incredibly unwieldy process and everyone in the past has always been afraid to do it because it was kind of like opening Pandora's box. Uh, but if things get bad enough, I think there'll be strong pressure to do that. I was just gonna say yes. <laughs> There's nothing better than arguing state constitutional law to state judges that don't necessarily expect it. And there's a lot that you can unpack there and I'll just say that very briefly. Well, I told all of you at the beginning this was going to be fun and a celebration, and uh, we know this much about history. It teaches us that freedom is no more than one generation away from dying, and that each generation has to fight for what they've achieved and what they want to hold on to and what they want to gain. These history makers and trailblazers to my left, this great historian to my right, I think gives us all in this room great inspiration 
to know that we are up to that fight going into the century and beyond. On behalf of the Historical Society, I want to thank all of you. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to our speakers.